I think the greatest fear that we face is ourselves, actually. I think it's, um, it's not anything that's external or anything that's superficial. I think the greatest fear you face is yourself because we all have dreams and it's very scary sometimes to accept the dream that you have. And it's scarier still to say, okay, I want that. It's scary because you're afraid that if you put your heart and soul into it and you fail, then how are you going to feel about yourself? Right? So being fearless means putting yourself out there and going for it, no matter what, go for it. Not for anybody else, but for yourself. And I had fears that um, everybody was going to be right. I made a poor choice, poor decision. Jumped from high school to, to, to the NBA. NBA. And I wasn't going to amount to anything. So that was always in the back of my mind, for sure. This funny thing is like we created these separate pillars. But the reality is it's all one thing because it all comes from within. It all comes from within us. We all experience these things at different stages and different points at different times. The key, I feel, is just to be aware of those moments as they occur. Right? You're aware of a certain fear or a certain obstacle or challenge. Right? You're just aware of those things. And then from there, you can navigate through them. But I look at them all as uh, one connecting thing. It's very simple. You have to dance beautifully in the box that you are comfortable dancing in. Right? Everybody's box is different. My box was to be extremely ambitious within the sport of basketball. Your box is different than mine. Right? Every kid here has their own box, but it doesn't mean that your box isn't as beautiful as mine. Right? Everybody has their own. It's your job to try to perfect it and make it as beautiful of a canvas as you can make it. And if you have done that, then you have lived a successful life. You have lived with a so it doesn't mean you have to go out here and do all of these crazy things. I'll have to be like this person or that person. No, what are you comfortable being? What is it that you want to do with your life? And once you have that, then you try to live it to the best of your ability. I think the definition of greatness is to inspire the people next to you. I think that's what greatness is or should be. It's not something that lives and dies with one person. It's how can you inspire a person to then in turn inspire another person that then inspires another person. And that's how you create something that I think lasts forever. I think that's our challenge as people, is to figure out how our story can impact others and motivate them in a way to create their own greatness. If we have a project and you're saying, okay, I can do that, that's not the project we want. The projects that say, I don't know if I can animate that. I don't know how to write that story. I don't know how to do that. Those are the things we want because through that curiosity, you'll reach a level that you didn't think was possible. And so running the studio, that's what I'm doing. If your job is to try to be the best basketball player you can be, mm -hmm. right? to do that, you have to practice, you have to train. Right? You want to train as much as you can, as often as you can. So if you get up at 10 in the morning, train at 11, right? 12, say 12, train at 12, train for two hours, 12 to two, you have to let your body recover. So you eat, recover, whatever. You get back out, you train, start training again at six. Train from six to eight. And now you go home, you shower, you eat dinner, you go to bed, you wake up, do it again, right? Those are two sessions. Now imagine you wake up at three, you train at four, you go four to six, come home, breakfast, relax. Now you're back at it again, nine to 11, right? Relax, and now all of a sudden you're back at it again, two to four, and now you're back at it again, seven to nine. Look how much more training I have done by simply starting at four. And so now you do that, and as the years go on, the separation that you have with your competitors and your peers just grows larger and larger and larger and larger and larger. And by year five or six, doesn't matter how, what kind of work they do in the summer, they're never gonna catch up because they're five years behind. <laughs> right? So it makes sense to get up and start your day early because you can get more work in. Well, what does losing feel like to you? That's exciting. Why is it exciting? Um, because it means you have different ways to get better. There's certain things that you can figure out that you can take advantage of, right? Certain weaknesses that were exposed mm. that you need to shore up. So it was exciting. I mean, it, I mean, it sucks to lose. Right. But at the same time, there are answers there if you just look at them. Because um, you get the information from losing more than from winning, probably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the answers are there when you win, too. You just have to look at them, yeah. right? So it's a constant process. It's exciting when you win. It's exciting when you lose because the process should be exactly the same whether you win or you lose, is you go back and you look and you find things that you could have done better. 
You find things that you've done well that worked, you figure out how did they work, why did they work, and how can you make them work again. Yeah. And, uh, but the hardest thing is to face that stuff. Um, that's a really, really tough challenge. But honestly, I bought into it. I bought into the meditation. I bought into the deeper connection that exists within the game. So when you watch our teams, or you watch any of Phil's teams, or Chicago teams, game six against Utah, you watch our games, you know, game seven against Boston, we were never rattled, ever, because we're always in the moment, always in the present, always extremely calm, always looking at the reality of the situation and not letting our emotions cloud our execution. And that comes from being in that meditative state that he would teach and preach from day one. It's really um, simple, it's like, Whatever you're doing at that moment is what you're doing at that moment. <laughs> you know, it's like that's where the obsessiveness is having attention to detail for the action that you are performing at the time you're performing. And if you can have that kind of focus, you can't help but to have a certain level of obsession or attention to detail. I had to learn it as well, though, because I, I, mean, I had a year of playing. Like when I played basketball in Italy, I was taller than everybody else and faster, like the age of 11. And I came back to America to play basketball, and it was not the same thing because kids were bigger, stronger. And so I went through a summer of playing basketball in America where I didn't score one point. Mm -hmm. It was one league, I didn't score one point, and uh, it was devastating. Um, but I had to, no, I'm not giving up. It's not going to happen. So you bounce back and you keep playing, you keep practicing, you keep practicing. But I mean, it wasn't handed to me. You didn't score one point? Not one. I mean, not even a free throw. It was very embarrassing because, you know, my father was a Philadelphia basketball legend. My uncle was a Philadelphia basketball legend. And now here I am, this kid with like these really big knee pads, and I'm walking around and I can't score anything. So it was like really embarrassing. Uh, that drove you? Of course it did. Of course it did. And I vowed to be much, much better. Well, I mean, those are the moments that occur, right? So whatever moments occur, good, bad, or indifferent, I can use those moments to propel me forward, use those as fuel to help me be a better player. Every kid, every person has the ability to put one foot in front of the other. One step at a time. Right? So like if you're saying, okay, I'm going to climb Mount Everest, and you're at the bottom of the mountain and you look up and you're going, oh, I'm not going to climb Mount Everest. <laughs> right? But if you break it down into sections, you just one foot in front of the other, one step at a time, next thing you know, you're at the top of the mountain. <sighs> what does love feel like? I think I would describe love as happiness. I think I'd describe it as a beautiful journey. Mm. You know, it has its ups and downs. Right? Whether it's in marriage, whether it's in a career, you know, things are never perfect. But through love, you continue to persevere. And you move through, you move through. And then through that storm, a beautiful sun emerges. Yeah. Right? And inevitably another storm comes. And guess what? You ride that one out too. So I think love is a certain determination and persistence to go through the good times and the bad times with the someone or something uh, that you truly love. Mm. My parents were, were great. Growing up, you know, they instilled in me the importance of imagination, of curiosity, and understanding that, okay, if you want to accomplish something, I'm not just going to sit here and say, yes, you can do whatever you want. Mm. Yes, you can, but you have to also put in the work to get there, right? So they taught me that at a really early age, man. When you grow up, as a kid thinking that the world is your oyster and all things are possible if you put in the work to do it, you grew up having that fundamental belief.